Well, you guessed it, we're still in Ezekiel. <laughs> but we're getting closer to some new stuff. I'm sure you're getting a little bit tired of hearing about all of the judgment. Uh, nevertheless, in chapters 1 through 3 of Ezekiel, we saw his commissioning. And from chapter 4 all the way through chapter 23, uh, we're seeing not only the promise of a judgment uh, being foretold for Jerusalem, uh, but we're also being told all of the reasons why. And I think that's really significant that God wants us to know when judgment and punishment comes, that they're deserved, that he's a just God. Uh, and more than that, he's a merciful and kind God. We don't get anywhere near what we deserve. Uh, nevertheless, we have been almost bogged down <clears throat> looking at all the different ways that God has told Ezekiel to tell the people about the coming judgment. If you remember during the commissioning time, he said, Ezekiel, guess what? You're going to tell them. They're not going to listen. They're not going to believe you. And so you can imagine this five or six year period uh, when Ezekiel is telling them all of the reasons why God is going to bring judgment. And they just don't even really seem to care. They don't seem to believe. They don't seem to listen. And no matter how many different ways he approaches it, and, and so it's very, very clear to me that there is one repeating over and over and over and over and over message of Ezekiel chapters 1 through 24. That they will know that I am the Lord thy God. It's an important lesson that we remember he's God. Whether we want him to or not, he is God. And one of the lessons through history has been that we might know that he is God. From creation to revelation, he is God. He's in control of all things. He allows some things to happen that we really don't understand why he allowed it to happen, but he is God. And while he may explain through Ezekiel all of the reasons for the judgment of Jerusalem, I'm sure that the people didn't fully understand that he is God and that they fully deserved what was coming to Jerusalem. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? So there we are, chapter 23, verse 49. One of the most important lessons any of us will ever learn and it's worth repeating again, because maybe you're sitting in a situation saying, I just don't understand. What is he trying to do? Let's take a look. Chapter 23, verse 49, repeated once more, one more time. Your lewdness will be requited upon you, and you will bear the penalty of worshiping your idols. Thus you will know that I am the Lord God. One of the problems we pastors have is that uh, when we talk to our parishioners about sin will find you out and uh, that which is done in darkness will be shouted from rooftops and uh, many, many other verses, including uh, you know, have eternal life, is that God's timetable isn't always our timetable. Uh, sometimes it seems like time just doesn't go by fast enough for people to see the direct result of either obedience or disobedience. And so people begin to wonder, does God really you know, prepare uh, our lives so that we can see the results of obedience or disobedience? Well, uh, I, it's not a new thought, but here finally in chapter 24, we find that in verses 1 and 2, it says, this very day, the siege is beginning. Finally, after 23 chapters of judgment and reasons for judgment, the judgment is actually coming. Uh, sometimes we wonder if God's going to ever punish those that are evil and wicked. And sometimes it's not in this lifetime. Sometimes it's in eternity. 
but God is not mocked. So I think it'd be wise for us to remember this passage of scripture from the New Testament as we think about people saying, I just don't believe God really does punish or reward according to our obedience or disobedience. So let's take a look at this verse. Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since fathers fell asleep, all continues just as from the very beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of the water and by water and through which the world at the time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So all you do have to do is point back to the days of Noah and recognize God's not going to be patient forever, and God does bring forth judgment. And although people may be mocking us now, saying, you know, we just don't know what we're talking about, uh, God's certainly not going to punish America. He's certainly not going to bring an end to this world. Uh, it's very clear that even in biblical times, in Second Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 7, God will bring judgment. And here in chapter 24, we finally see that judgment beginning. That judgment that God has been talking about through Ezekiel and the people have not been listening. But here it is. It's actually happening. It's a historical event. We know that Jerusalem's city was burned. We know that people were slaughtered. We know that the gates were knocked down. We know that these things took place. And we know why. All we have to do is read the book of Ezekiel and we find out all of the reasons. All of the kinds of abominations, iniquities, and other faults that the people had done and how they would not listen to God. And so it's very, very important for us to remember that God will bring about a final judgment. And all of the things that he promised and all of the covenants that he made, he will keep. Now, let's take a look at the very ending of chapter 24 because I think it's worthy of our final study. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, behold, I'm about to take from you the desire of your eyes with a blow, but you shall not mourn, you shall not weep, and your tears shall not come. Groan silently, make no mourning for the dead, Bind on your turban, put on your shoes, on your feet, and do not cover your mustache, and do not eat the bread of men. So I spoke to the people in the morning, and in the evening my wife died, and in the morning I did as I was commanded. So many times we preachers have little pity parties. We're not where we want to live. We're not having the audience that we want to have. We don't have the size church we think we ought to have. People don't seem to be listening. To, people don't seem to appreciate. Uh, we have a pity party, and we think about how rough we have it. Uh, but there's two things that I want both the preacher and the laity to listen to in this particular part of the lesson. Obedience. God desires obedience. Ezekiel was told that God was going to take the most precious thing in his sight, his wife. And he was going to take her and not ask Ezekiel to mourn or to carry on as most people would when they lost the thing they most loved. It was an example for the people that they were going to lose what they should have loved more than anything else. But they deserved what God and here it's very, very clear that while this duty that Ezekiel had been called to was very difficult and extremely difficult when he had to lose his own wife, Ezekiel was found to be obedient. And no matter what God asks us to do, it's important for us to remember to be obedient. And that's my thought for the day. God bless you and have a great day.